Did you hear that? Did that I did hear that. Okay. Um, I've never had that before. There you go. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to thank you very much for joining us. This is um, a great honor. And uh, I think that having this opportunity is an amazing opportunity for us to discuss how ARPs were integral in your in your career and um, I'm really interested to hear some of your thoughts about this. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is an archives live session, except that we're not doing it live, of course, we're doing a pre-recording. And, um, and I'm welcoming Tony Banks to our audience. So I did invite a few people to submit some questions. So some of the questions I'll be asking are questions that were submitted by um, a few uh, friends that are very much into what they call gear, you know, all into all the different instruments. And, and some of the questions are mine, which really pertain to sort of the historical uh, use of synthesizers amongst um, what I call pivotal or pioneer musicians, such as yourself. So that's... Uh, Sounds great. Thank you. Um, so I always start in the beginning as how you actually started being uh, a musician, we, I was myself. I was actually sort of encouraged slash forced to take piano lessons, and then I, I fell in love with it. Um, classical music was around the house. We have a baby grand Steinway. We had upright, and there was so many opportunities to play that. I, after I uh, decided I could stand my piano teacher, which sometimes I couldn't, I ended up um, really falling in love with it. Tell me a little bit about your experiences. Well, when I was very young, I used to sort of like just to hit the piano like a lot of kids do and could sort of pick out basic melodies quite well. And my mother, as you said, uh, made me have piano lessons, um, which I can't say I ever really enjoyed, uh, particularly in the early days. Uh, it just seemed like, you know, relentlessly playing the same piece for a year to get a grade or something. Um, and, uh, you know, this carried on really until I was about uh, 13. And then um, I had a music teacher who I didn't get on with at the school I'd gone to, but he suggested I had another music teacher there. And I, I swapped uh, teachers and he, he was much, much better for me, much better chap. But it, meanwhile, I'd found out when I was about 11, I, I could really play by ear quite well. I could pick out stuff. When I was about 13 or 14, I had a friend who sort of showed me how to use that ability and, and to sort of work, you know, left-hand stuff to go with the melodies that I could get. And then I found really after that, I got to the stage where I was just, I could play, I'd hear, listen to the radio, I'd hear a song, I could play it on the piano. And, um, and that was much more entertaining, it was much lazier, didn't involve lots of practice. But I'm very grateful for the fact that I was taught all the kind of, you know, rudiments, the sort of uh, scales and arpeggios and the ability to transpose and everything that you you pick up from that. Um, I never really had, the, I mean, I know people always say always too modest, but I, I never really had the technique to be a, a really good classical pianist. I just didn't, there were many better pianists than me at school. Um, but I kind of, what I could do was, uh, I found that I could create, you know, I could write stuff. And, and the one thing my music teacher said to me that you know may not play all the right notes, but it's always a good performance. You know, I sort of could could get that across quite well. So I think that that's really where I sort of, you know, the performing and um, and the ability to write. You know, that was that was the crucial thing. Really. That that's an amazing piece of wisdom that your teacher gave you. I think that the performance is what it's about. Well, yes, and I not, don't really consider myself performing is not why I'm in this business at all. But I think if you just, you know, I could play a piece and it would sound more exciting than someone who could play it technically much better. 
And, and I think that's, that was what he was trying to get across to me. And, you know, we had a good relationship with the second teacher and he, he let me learn a lot of pieces that are quite influential in my career. I mean, uh, you know, obviously Rachmaninoff is a pianist and Ravel, who probably influenced my piano style very much in those early, early Genesis albums, you know, in terms of uh, playing and chords and everything. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm eternally grateful to him. Did you listen to a lot of classical music as a, uh, as a younger person then? Um, it was in the house, um, and yes, I listened to a certain amount. And uh, I think the main thing in the house we had was sort of show tunes, you know. Uh, my mother had all these sort of Rodgers and Hammerstein stuff, uh, which I used to love. And, uh, and the other thing that was quite a big influence in those early days was, was hymns. We were made to go to chapel or church every day at the schools I was at. And, you know, when you got a good, good piece of music, it was, it was very uplifting, really. Um, yeah, I mean, the classical stuff, some, some pieces, you know, you got to know. Obviously, you're, back in those days, you were talking about 78 records, you know, this right. 78 RPM. So uh, there was a version of Bolero that um, occupied one side of a, of a 78, which is about sort of two and a half minutes. Uh, so it got to the, the big moment very quickly. But I, I used to love that. So that was kind of, you know, uh, quite exciting. And then, you know, we, uh, I don't know, went to what I could, once we got into having LPs and things, then, then I started to hear a bit more. And at school, I used to play a certain amount. So, but it was a more slow process because I never really, we didn't really go much to live concerts. So, you know, to hear whole pieces of music was quite difficult. But my mother was a, was a good pianist and she used to play stuff on the piano all the time. And she was very fond of Chopin. And um, I used to love hearing her play that. And mm. like you, I had a, actually had a boudoir grand, which is even smaller than a baby grand, oh. which was, um, is only about, sort of, but it's a grand piano, but it's only about four foot, you know, three or four feet. Uh, lovely yeah. sound, actually. And uh, I used to wonk away on that. And she did, and, and you know, she was, it was, she was, so music was very much part of my, my childhood, yes. Oh, that makes a difference. Oh, my, my dad loved Chopin and he played a lot of it. And the last time I actually heard um, a live concert was uh, listening to Chopin with my mom. Uh, we, and it, it just reminded me so much of my father. He would always uh, sit and play piano when my mother and I were trying to get out of the house, you know? So. <laughs> And depending on how uh, late we were, you know, he, it would depend on what kind of piece he would play. <laughs> right. If we had a lot of time, it was more relaxed. It was, you know, otherwise uh, he'd start to get into some more percussive stuff. It was really funny. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. Um, what kind of music did you listen to um, on your own, like you and your friends? What did you like to hear? Be and this is before Genesis, before you formed a band. When I was very young, it was just whatever was, was around. My brother had a few things like, I mean, I, I used to like, um, I mean, Rock Around the Clock, I remember him having that, but things like, uh, I was quite keen on Frankie Lane, actually. He did oh. a version of um, 16 Tons. And I know there's lots of other versions of that song, but his version of it was my was the one I used to love. I used to play it to death. Oh, wow. And there was a sort of spoken piece called The Shifting Whispering Sands, um, which was done by some American orchestra and the guy who actually did the speaking was hardly credited actually, but I used to love that. So funny things. And then when I was about 11, I listened to uh, um, what they, we call over here, Pick of the Pops, which was a, a show which was based around the hip parade. And um, I, that was the first time I'd ever really known there was such a thing. And I heard all these songs almost for the first time. And I remember the top 10 very clearly. I mean, the number one was, was I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, it's all right. Number one was, uh, <laughs> was uh, The Young Ones by Cliff Richard, which was, a, a, you know, he was a very big star over here. And I think number two was Rock Hula Baby by Elvis Presley. So kind of, I was introduced to that and, uh, and I just found I loved everything. <laughs> I had no, no discrimination. I, it was Multiplication by Bobby Darren, loved it. Let There Be Drummers by Sandy Nelson. You know, I think when you first hear this stuff, you, it's just stunning, you know, and I, I was so keen and became a complete fanatic actually. And the first, single I actually bought for myself, which was around that time was The Wanderer by Dion. Oh my um, goodness. Yeah. Which I still think is fantastic piece of music. It's just uses a standard 12 bar chord sequence, but it's got a great sax solo, really good vocals and a great, great, great sound, a very sort of very meaty sound. Um, so I was, I was into sort of, you know, the, it, I, anything really, and it's, it's simple, complicated. I didn't care what it was really. Most stuff was simple in those days and I loved it all. 
So it sounds like you were a sponge just sort of absorbing all the different music that you were hearing around you. I was, and then as I said, I used to like to after a bit, you know, when I was a little bit older, I could, when I was playing the stuff on the piano, and obviously certain people appealed more because it's much easier to play a, a Beatles tune on the piano because it's got nice chords and a melody than it was to say play a, a Stones tune, you know, because Satisfaction's a great song, love it, but it doesn't sound very good on a piano. It's, you know, got one riff going all the way through and stuff. Um, so you found you've got your favourites, like I loved the, the Kinks and, and the Zombies, actually. I love them too at that stage. And in America, obviously, the Tamla Motown and, and Simon and Garfunkel, all that stuff. Very melodic music, I think, appealed to me more than anything else. So, um, you know, but I had, as I said, by the, in 1963, I think I liked just about everything. And in, by 1968, I'm not sure I liked anything. <laughs> it kind of, <laughs> it just, you know, more I got used to, understood music and started writing my own, I got less and less satisfied with, um, particularly with chart music, not so much, uh, obviously the, the fantastic sort of albums by people like uh, Pink Floyd and Moody Blues and stuff, you know, but, but this, the things that were hits were, were leaving me a bit cold by that stage. It really sounds like you would have gotten along well with my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Again, he never really listened to um, rock music, though he did start to bring home a few albums. So I, I did grow up, listen, he bought me my first Beatles album. And uh, we listened to a lot of electronic music, which is probably not surprising. Mm. Uh, Mort Sabotnik and Gershon Kingsley. And I remember a lot of Gershon Kingsley in the house and uh, Leon Kirshner. Did you hear any of those? Uh, musicians when you first started to get into synthesizers or was it from bands switch on Bob? Not really I, I i kind of the reason i like the synthesizers because they could play melodic lines with different kind of sounds you know um obviously i, I was you know the um clockwork orange score and switched on bark that stuff did you know i i like that i was interesting you know and it was amazing how at the time it sounded it sounded very orchestral i mean you hear it now and it, it doesn't really but it's but it was an amazing thing all the same um, and, you know, and obviously one was looking to, to try and get into synthesizers and um, from about that stage. And the first thing, one I ever tried was a thing called an EMS synthesizer, I think, mm -hmm. um, which I couldn't get on with at all because it, basically the octaves were out of tune. You had to tune it up first of all, and then it could only produce a few sounds. And I, I just forgot it. I didn't use it at all. And that's why when, um, I don't want to jump the gun, but when I got, uh, first went to went to a, uh, to a music store, and the, the pro soloist was there, and I fiddled around with. I thought well, this is fantastic because I haven't got to tune it up. It's got lots of sounds on it. Um, there's a lot I can do with it. Also got a great keyboard, very very easy to play. Spring yeah. spring loaded, you know, more springier than anything I'd ever played before. And um, I thought I could use that, you know, and uh, and obviously it became a very big part of you know in the early seventies, particularly of, of what I what I did. And um, it was just great to have the ability to, you know, switch extreme sounds. When I used to like using the organ and the electric piano for solos, which I did uh, as well, but the, it just was suddenly a whole thing. You had sort of, you know, little trumpety kind of sounds and everything. And, and that was really nice. Yeah, the pro soloist was my favorite as a kid. Um, I, I got very intimidated by, you know, the modulars, which were the first ones I saw, but the pro soloist was the one I always went to because, I, you know, I could switch it on and there was an oboe and there was a... Well, that's right. And I think that's what people sort of wanted. I mean, it's all, it's all very well programming everything. And as I later got into, the, I did get a 2600, which was quite fun to do stuff, but it wasn't really an instrument you could use live particularly successfully because, you know, you couldn't change sounds. And also the great thing about uh, the 2600 was you could get a sound that's fantastic. And, and you try to get it again, <laughs> and you couldn't get it. I had a wonderful bell, uh, which is uh, features on my uh, album, uh, it was Tubular Bell on uh, Curious Feeling, which opens uh, the, the yeah. piece uh, called Forever Morning. Um, and I, it was great and I was so good. And then I, I couldn't get it again. And I've tried this, you hear the bell a couple of times and later in the song, it's a different, and um, it's a different note, I think. And it, it doesn't sound as good, but that's a ring modulator. You just had to get everything just, just right. So the great thing about the Pro Soloist was that it was exactly the same every time. You knew what it would do. And um, things like Portamento, which I hadn't sort of experienced before, was great fun. You could mm. do a bit of that. Uh, so it, it, it was a massive change for me because, because obviously within Genesis, what happened was when we lost our first guitarist, I started playing all the lead lines on my 
um, on the keyboard. So I had used, I used electric piano originally. And so I got into the idea of playing with two keyboards at a time. And I know a lot of people have done it, but at the, you know, it wasn't that known at the time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so th I had this thing, the fact that it was monophonic didn't matter because I keep the chords going on the organ or something else, you know. And normally when I did solos, even on a, on a um, piano or organ, it would probably be a monophonic uh, part, you know, because I was playing like a, an instrumentalist in an orchestra, like a violin part or something. So you had the same kind of restrictions. So I found that, I found it really easy to do that. And, you know, and I, I, I don't know, it just, just, just was, it worked perfectly within the group as well, because, you know, Mike, um, it was it was very good at setting up a kind of uh, a basis, uh, you know, great with riffs and and just getting a good feel going and stuff. And but he tended to stay in one chord and one key, so I could change the chords with the um, with the organ, you know. And some and I'd, sometimes it would change, and he'd have to change with me because it was just too weird. Other times he just kept going relentlessly, and that worked really well too. So you know, I, it, it in the combination of that, uh, the freedom I got with with all that worked really well. So it wasn't odd moving from uh, basically being polyphonic to monophonic. Well, no, I sort of had added, I think with the, the, the big change for me was changing from piano to organ, which is what I did when we, because pianos were very difficult to mic in the early days. So you tended to, so the only instrument I had on stage um, when we first started playing gigs was, was the Hammond organ. And um, initially I sort of, you know, you can't stop yourself trying to play piano on the organ a bit. And there's a song, early song called The Knife, where I pretty much did that. Sounds okay, actually, but that was what happened. Um, and then I sort of slowly got into the idea that you could hold your hand down and it would stay, you know. Um, so that became very much as of the big chords, sort of kind of big Genesis thing after that, I suppose. So that was a change. Once I got used to that, just playing with, with one, one thing, because I wasn't, it was never really polyphonic, uh, monophonic, because I had the left hand I could play a chord on. That's true. And that's really what the pro soloist was built for, for someone to put on top of an organ. And so they would be able to have that ease of use um, while still having an organ. And that's, uh, you know, that, that, that is um, probably one of the most uh, powerful uses, I think, of the pro soloist is to have that combination. Um, how did you come to acquire your first one? Did you hear did you hear it first? Did you get approached by, uh, say, an ARP rep in London, or you know, how did that work? How did you? No, I just went into a music shop um, with 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 the roadie at the time. Um, I think we were always kind of looking for something. You know, I don't know. I can't remember if he even knew about it really. But we went in there. And this thing was here. I said, "What's this? What's this?" And played it. And and I thought this is great. So it was a kind of um, no. I wasn't recommended or anything. I, I was just as having suffered the EMS synthesizer. Um, it was just what I was looking for, really, something that didn't require, you know, too much um, fiddling about with in order to make it sound good, you know. So, so that's what it was. It just came out of the blue, really. I didn't even, I didn't really know much about synthesizers as such, you know. And I, I didn't even really probably know that it was a synthesizer. Actually, it was just an instrument that could produce all these sounds. Obviously, later on, you find out that it's all built out of sort of sine waves and square waves and all that. Um, but it was uh, the, the first introduction to it, which. It's kind of good in a way. It's like to you know, it's like to use a to use a dishwasher. You don't need to know about the electronics. It makes it work. It just it, it washes right. dishes. That's great, and that's how I saw it. Do you call it ARP by the way, or ARP? I notice in in. I don't know. Both, I think, probably normally refer to it as the ARP because it's quicker. But ARP, I, I've called it that as well. <laughs> But, you know, going back is, is, is you know, the, a lot of people in the beginning, I remember, had there was pushback saying, well, these synthesizers are going to replace uh, symphonies. You know, there was a lot of fear. I remember hearing about that over the dinner table conversations that, oh, it's, uh, you know, peop um, uh, classical musicians are worried about uh, these being replacements and, and and uh, which was really confounding to my father because he thought, well, this is just another layer of of a many layers that can be played in an orchestra or can be played uh, anywhere. And uh, he started employing people to play multiple uh, pro soloists with 2600s and demo um, all the different possibilities and, and, and such with classical musicians as well. They actually played with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. They had some 2600s and uh, solos playing with them. 
the cinema orchestra. Yeah, well, I think when the, 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 the thing with the orchestra, orchestral musicians, like when it first came in, obviously with things like the, um, the Coca Orange stuff and everything, you know, I mean, it sort of was trying to play the whole orchestra part, you know. Um, and I think, you know, no one quite knew how far this could go. Obviously, if you think about what's happening nowadays, because it's gone all the way. But at the right. time, whether these totally synthesized kind of sounds could could replace, you know, and initially it was amazing to hear something sounded vaguely like a string. Well, that's brilliant, you know, but that was the first time you heard it. And after a bit, you realize that it doesn't really sound like a string. It's it sort of can simulate it a bit. Um, so I, I think it's sort of. Um, I mean, I think, you know, these these sounds have their have their place, but uh, I, I think. I don't think they are really, I mean, I don't know to what extent they, they you know, you can use them with orchestras and everything, but if you, you want a flute, you, go, you get a flute, don't you really, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, do you remember that first rehearsal that you had uh, with your new pro soloist after you said you were working with EMS and also used a Mellotron as well, right? I had the Mellotron earlier on. Um, well, the Mellotron, of course, was you know, that had a genuine string sound. I mean, it was kind of a bit wobbly normally, so it had a kind of quality of its own. Um, but I'd use that. I used that, in fact, on the second Genesis album, Trespass, which is one I hired. We borrowed one, and I used it on the song Visions of Angels, and it, um, it, we liked the sound. And I think particularly once Steve joined the band, he was always very keen <laughs> that to get a Mellotron. He just, he was very keen on that. And I actually bought one of the ones off King Crimson. Oh, wow. Okay. Which Robert Fripp assured me uh, was the one that was used on Court of the Crimson King. But he had three. <laughs> and I think he said that about all of them uh, in order to sell them. But anyway, <laughs> um, I got it. And I just, uh, that was a massive thing for me, really, because the strings and brass um, combination, we had this sort of uh, bass pedal on the left hand keyboard. Obviously, this wasn't designed to be taken on the road at all. Mm -hmm. And um, so the introduction to Watch of the Skies, which became a sort of very significant part of Genesis set um, was all done on, on, on the Mellotron. Uh, and that was, uh, so I, I, I got into the idea of different instruments, you know, strings, brass, all the rest of it being um, used within, within a group situation. But I was never trying to think of it as a substitute really. You know, a little later on, I tried to sort of do, I did a couple of songs where I used the Mellotron strings as a sort of almost like a string part. But most of the time it was just big, big chords on the Mellotron. So the combination, of course, of the mellotron with the um, uh, with the with the, the arp again was was a was a massive thing, you know that which very much featured on on the sort of selling them by the pound album, you know, which which was the main where the, where I first really used the pro soloist. In the cinema show, it's um it it seems like you've you explored the entire set or presets in in the uh, with the pro soloist in that um well i about five or six i think just five or six. better than others i kind of um yeah i mean it was just i was fiddling along and i mike had this riff and i was just playing along on top of it and and you know this sort of the sort of particularly the little trumpety sound <clears throat> sounded really good so i kind of used that as a sort of basis point and then then sort of malusha things came in later in other parts i mean you know while we were improvising i was improvising on top of this dung 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 for hours and um you know try everything <clears throat> and in the end i just put together the bits and pieces that i thought sounded nicest and also kind of had a natural flow to them and um so it ended up all being on that a combination of the pro solos with the organ playing the chords all the time as an example of where you know, Mike was in one key, and I kept trying to move him to another key, and things, <laughs> like, and, uh, and things like that. So it was, you know, that was, it was just great to be able to do all that, and it's so easy to play. You know, that was the great thing about it. You can play fast on it, and it sounded, you know, it was easy to do. And also the, discovering things which I like. The obviously some of the sounds uh, had no release, whereas other sounds had a strong release. You know, and so you could get legato things even if you played fast the portamento of course was another thing that uh, i'd come across for the first time so it was a whole load of new things that you could do on that that um I mean, the fact it's monophonic sometimes is quite good because when you played a second note the first note would stop so that's not a bad thing sometimes because it means you can you can play really fast with a legato sound without having to worry about anything else you know um so yes it was it was it was a you know i don't know i mean i it was very important for that really. I, mean, with a, I needed that instrument to do that solo. And that was a, a, another quite important song in the early Genesis days. 
So I know you transitioned later to other keyboards um, like the Yamaha DX7, which I remember uh, distinctly when it came out. It was such a big deal. How was that? How was it playing that? And, and tell me some of the other instruments that sort of happened in between. I know later you did go to a quadra, but you um, worked with the Yamaha for a while. What was, um, what well, was the DX7 came after. I think that the first thing that really that, that was new for me was the, the Profits, Profit 5 and then the Prophet 10. I mean, the thing about those was they were very easy to program. Um, you know, they, you had basic sounds you could get with them, which were really good. Some of them, you know, you had some good sounds, but so easy to adjust, to change them slightly and then record it. And, you know, virtually every sound I used on the Prophet was probably custom made. Um, and that to me was a massive thing, which was obviously you couldn't do with the Pro Soloist and the 2600 was a thing, the Quadra came later. So the Prophet was, um, was the key one really. The DX7, I mean, to program the DX7 was a nightmare. I mean, I did do a couple of things on it, you know, um, but uh, you know, it was chance, pure chance, what you ended up with. You had no idea with all these algorithms and trying desperately to see what they would do. Um, and I went through a few of these. I mean, I tried the, the, uh, the Yamaha, the CS80, which a lot of people really love, but I didn't really get on with that. I used it for one, one album. I used it for quite a few sounds on that, but, um, I think it was the profit that changed things a lot. The other thing, of course, that happened around it all this time was MIDI. Uh, mm -hmm. This was a, a massive change um, to be able to play one instrument from another and combine sounds in that way and all the rest of it. It was that made so much difference. And I think it was around the time when the Art Quadra came in. And the problem was the Quadra was it could do it, it was all one instrument. It effectively did what MIDI did, but on one instrument. But by then, it was almost, I think, um, out of date when it was when it came out, because it was a combination of a, of a polyphonic synthesizer, two two um, uh, you know monophonic synthesizers, I think, and, and a bass pedal or something. And it was a wonderful instrument in the sense that you could do all the stuff, great sounds, had inbuilt kind of phasing, it had inbuilt stuff, it had the trigger thing, um, and I used it a lot. I mean, the triggering was it was a great factor. I used to trigger it from. Uh, when I was using a drum machine, uh, the cowbell, to trigger the sound. So, for example, Mama, which is obviously a thing where it has this sort of a chugging thing going all the way through it. That is the quadra being triggered from a cowbell. And I'm changing the chords, but obviously the actual, when it sounds, I'm, I'm just sustaining the chord, but it goes ding, 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 like that. Whenever the cowbell played, it opened it up. And that was a sort of new thing for me. I mean, you could do it electronically with keypexes and stuff, but it was... Um, quite significant. I'd actually discovered how to do all that on my solo album that came out just before that called The Fugitive. And there's a song called on that called This Is Love, where um, I used a combination of the, um, the quadra being triggered and the, and I think it was a, an organ or something being opened by a keypex gate. And it was great because I could play the two things and they were just going to do like this. And it was just everything was sort of echoing all around the place. Um, and it was really good. And then, you know, trying a slightly sort of subtler rhythm, another song on that album called By You, um, the, the chords are totally triggered by, again, by a cowbell when I'm sustaining a chord and it's the quadra that's playing it. I found it a really, really useful tool, but it was kind of, it's one of those things where it, if it come out five years earlier, it would have been fantastic. Uh, but when, by the time it came out, because the MIDI was either out or just about to come out, you know, the, the main, advantage of it being able to play two instruments at the same time had kind of gone so but it, I, I still love the instrument the built-in arpeggiator which i used on on uh, the duke album on uh, instrumental piece called duke's travels um which was wonderful sort of thing which again i hadn't come across before but so yes i mean I, all the instruments were that the, the arp instruments harp and what you will um were, were crucial to join that from selling England through to Abacab. Um, I used them, and no, obviously, too, through to the, the, the Mama album, actually. I used them all the time, really. It was a really key part. And it's only really because of, I think, because of uh, uh, later instruments which were more able to um, sample and uh, obviously computers now that, that I stopped using them, really, because, you know, you can sound, I mean, I can create the sounds I had pretty much or perhaps improve on them 
I know it's heresy to say that, um, with 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 the modern instruments, you know. So um, and sometimes I don't really, you know. Sometimes I want want just what I had, and there are lots of monophonic uh, things out there if you want to use them. Yeah, and then with the monophonic, you know, there's often uh, happy accidents, and sometimes not so happy accidents. So. Yeah, well, as you said, the other thing was you could double track them, which I used to do, you know, the, 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 the pro soloists, so you could get some harmony parts and things going, and sometimes just double tracking them to get a sort of like a beefier sound. But it was, you know, you could do a lot with it. It was one of those things. It responded very well to effects as well. So you put um, a bit of repeat echo on it and immediately sounded like, you know, much more of an instrument. On its own, it's, it's kind of a bit lonely, you know, but you give it a bit of width and fat and sort of, and you know, a bit of chorus and flanging and everything and, and it suddenly sounds you know really good when um what did you play on back in new york it's such an interesting interesting song in a way it doesn't it doesn't um i mean there, you, you have such a multifaceted um repertoire but i um back in new york was very interesting to me um were you was this by any chance a response to any like the german synth bands like Kraftwerk or is not really it's the main riff funnily enough is played mainly on a six-string bass. Mike came up with the riff. Um, we actually all used to like kind of arpeggio riffs is something that Genesis always quite liked, I think, really. Um, and as you mentioned, Tube Way Army, obviously that the, the big song they had, uh, Our Friends Electric, which came out much later, <clears throat> which used the same kind of idea. But Mike, he had this six-string bass, so he could play this sort of the dun -dun -dun -dun, this thing um, in seven, Seven four again, which is you know again, it's basically the reason why he and I write in these funny times, which is because we're not very good at keeping time. Um, we keep, <laughs> keep, keep missing our beat, and it sounds all right to us. So we think, well, secret. Are you sure you want to have this broadcast? No, <laughs> I don't like that. And uh, so we kind of what happened with that, with that was I played along uh, with the with the uh, with Mike's part um, using the pro solos that happened, and then also went a few other places with the uh, with what I was doing so um, take it slightly away from the main riff but it was so that's it's a common the, the basic sound though is, is a six string bass through an through a repeat echo so you get the da 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 da, da, da like that um, and uh, and then me with a I think playing the sort of one of the more guitar -y kind of um, uh, presets on on the pro soloist again through an echo and it yeah, produced a good sound is it you know it's, it was for us, it was a quite a novel song in a way that we we allowed ourselves to be very, very repetitive, which is something we weren't normally. We used to like to try and change, chop and change all the time, but with that, we kept the the um, you know the riff going through most of the, through a large part of the song, and and allowed Peter to sort of just to scream on top of it, which he, which he quite enjoyed. He didn't enjoy it live, I have to say, but he enjoyed it on the record. <laughs> Well, that's why it reminded me um, of some of those synth bands, you know, it was, uh, it's interesting. Um, I mean, we really were not really aware. We knew, obviously I'd heard, I don't know when Autobahn came out. I heard it and quite liked it, but I never sort of quite saw these things in the sort of in genres like that. It's, it's mm -hmm. a song I liked, I liked it, you know, and a song I didn't like, I didn't like it. It could be any kind of song really. And it was quite, you know, it did the sound of it was quite interesting, but it wasn't, it wasn't as sort of as radical as to me as perhaps it seemed to a lot of people really. Um, I, I just quite like the idea of, of just these guys sort of, not, you know, r rambling on with far and far and far and like that. It just sounded, it was quite funny, you know, as well as being quite entertaining, you know. You know, I agree about the genres thing. I, I didn't grow up thinking about genres. Music was music. It was popular music, um, something you heard on the radio. And and uh, and I think that the 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 pigeonholing that has happened you know you have to be prog rock you have to be punk rock you have to be you know this or that is is very limiting i um while enjoying a genre is definitely understandable okay this is what i prefer um i don't i don't always see the use of it i think it it become it becomes a sort of elitist after a while so, it's basically it's 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 easier for journalists to pigeonhole things and and I think they and I don't think audiences often did have this kind of thing. I mean, I've said it before, but I'll, uh, there was a story where I was wandering around in London, um, actually near the Marquee Club, and um, 
I, this guy on the street turned around to me, real punk, you know, everything kind of, <laughs> all the whole whole deal, and shouted at me, he said, oh, Tony Banks, you know, and and I said, yeah, hi, you know, he said, oh, I got something, to, what, do I, what do I sign, what do I sign, I got something, what he had, anything he had in his hand was a copy of Pretty Vacant by the Sex Pistols. <laughs> that's so so I, and I thought, that's great. I mean, you know, I actually quite like the Pretty Vacant, I think it's quite a good rock song as it happens, but that's, um, you know, neither here nor there. I, I never really, as I said, I mean, I, I'd rather... You know, there are good, good and bad in every genre, and I think people people like the set like it. And I never found you know, we used to have in the early days we used to have a lot of I remember a lot of um, Hell's Angels and people used to come to the shows and stuff. You know, they weren't perhaps weren't so sure about some of the quiet stuff at the beginning. I don't know really, but then we used to get quite intense at the end, and they loved that. So I, you had a, a good variety of, of audience, and I, I still think still think we do really. Yeah, the, we've. The, the press has always kind of tried to put us in a certain category, which I don't think we are really, which is sort of, you know, being, we were a progressive group, I suppose, in a way, no doubt about that, but <clears throat> somehow always a little bit too intellectual or something, I don't know what it is, or, and uh, I don't think it was ever our thing, really. we just, we just did whatever, we used to do some very lightweight songs, as well as doing some very intense and long and heavy and serious songs. <laughs> And I think that makes sense because as a human, we're all multifaceted and, and just being all of one, one excuse me, all of one thing. Uh, I had to sort of clean the room, you know, to make it, make the view look decent, right? <laughs> well, Zoom things, one always looks at uh, people, what's behind people, you know, so you have to be very careful what you've got. I've got virtually nothing. So, you know, it's sort of very distant. You can't see much. So. Are you in your studio? Uh, well, I'm actually in my studio, but it's also kind of an office. So it's full of stuff, you know, so kind of. Yeah, I've been, I've been uh, sort of living in this virtual environment for so long that I've, I've cultivated the, you know, you get the bookshelf when you see the, Love, you go yeah. to the news news people and they they interview the people with the bookshelf. So, so what can I put back here? Yeah, they, what they, they have to make certain they've got the right books behind them. Get rid right. of all these kind of books that you shouldn't have, the sort of racist and sort of thing. <laughs> whatever books you want. <laughs> get rid of Mein Kampf, it's gone, you know. Oh, gosh. All right, so about... um. You switched over to the twenty six hundred, um, and I, that must have been that must have been kind of shocking. You meant we you mentioned it earlier about uh, you know not being able to keep a patch, but you did bring it on tour. Yes, I, yeah, I, 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 I forgot I did that actually. That was very brave. Um, yeah. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know. Did I have the pro solos as well? I can't remember. And maybe I had it instead. I mean, I don't know. I must have found a way of doing things a bit quicker on it or something. But I don't. You know, it was not really a, an instrument for for the stage because of the fact that it wasn't always the same. And you know, and I don't know. I just it did. I don't know really why I had it. <laughs> I mean, I liked the instrument. I, I mean, it was great fun on albums, and I used it a lot on particularly on the Curious Feeling. I love the sounds, but it was uh, it was not really a live instrument, you know. But then, you know, neither was the Mellotron, and that, that was we took that on the road. It was designed to go in some, you know, in some living room somewhere. Um, and Very bottom them, heavy. It was heavy. It was it was it was incredibly fragile. Um, it had uh, it was built. They used I think bicycle chains and vacuum cleaner motors. I think was what it was actually used. It was you know real prototypes, the original ones. And um, you know you you moved it about, and you had this incredibly complex system of of of, of tapes which sort of rotated and stuff. And they always got tied up around themselves, and they wobbled and didn't work and we were re rebuilding it every day when we took it on the road and until they brought out the little little white one which was much simpler which had a cassette kind of you put in um you know that changed everything again but that, when the, we did a tour uh two or three tours with that Mellotron and it was I have to say it was a nightmare when it worked it was fantastic but when it didn't work which was probably 80 percent of the time it was a nightmare so it was rather, it was a bit sort of um, traumatic going on stage when you knew that thing was there. I used to have nightmares actually, that I'd go on stage with just the Mellotron and I had to do the whole set on the Mellotron. <laughs> and then all the tapes got tangled and, and all. Do that. And you can't play fast songs at all. I mean, you, can, you go, duh, 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 that's as fast as you can play on a Mellotron. You go like that, nothing happens at all. So it's kind of like, um, it's a love-hate relationship really. Lovely sounds, fantastic sounds, but. It is. I love the sound of it. Yeah, well, the strings and the brass were great. And then when they brought out the little one, um, the voices was a really good addition and had nice oboe. But again, it then it got superseded really by the 
the, the sort of sampling synthesizers, you know, which are the emulators and everything which came in. And uh, that, that that changed everything in that direction. Really. Yeah, I saw the inside of one recently. It was pretty interesting, the, the tape. Well, the big one. Yeah. Because the big one, because it had, because the little one didn't try and do this thing of, of searching for sounds. It, it was the only sounds were on the cassettes. You took another cassette and put another one in, as opposed to the um, the old one, which which had a sort of like, you know, one great long tape, loops of tape, which had to start at the right point in order to, for the, for the note to start, you know, if you wanted strings, it had to wheel madly to find the strings. And this was happening on every note. Every note was a different string, different tape. So it was a nightmare. So coming to the quad, back to the quadra, uh, did you did you reach for it for a sort of an extension of, of the soloist or was it a reaction to buy it from working with others or it was just you heard that lush sound and you had to have that? What, what brought you to the quadra? Well, no, I mean, I'd obviously I'd used the ARP stuff uh, before, before that and I, I liked the instruments and I knew that I could get the the monophonic sounds were on it, you know, and I would start, I got into the, the polymog. Um, if I can say the word moog in the presence of art. Oh, of course, of course. I love moog. Uh, no. Well, the polymog, which was, I, I really liked for lots of reasons. So, you know, obviously it was, it was um, a polyphonic instrument, but quite limited in terms of what you could do with it really, but it had very good, um, uh, the pedals were great because you could open up the filters and everything on the pedals, which was something I, I used quite extensively at various times. Um, so in a sense, though, I wanted something that could do a bit of that, which with the quadra obviously could do, and and have the other stuff. And, you know, I, I think I, I got it on spec a bit, really. I think I got, I had the first model, I think, number one. I was asked, offered it, and I took it. And, um, and I used it, you know, very extensively uh, while I had it. As you say, to have the nice, uh, good, good sort of fat sounds on it and the triggering which was a big factor that's why we ended up using as long as we did I think and and also the arpeggiating so the combination sounds you can press you can play it like that and it's just so the massive sound will be there it would sound fantastic um, and but I could also do the solos on it so it, you know because it had the pros kind of pro solo sort of sounds in it really because you could monophonic sounds and you could play two notes at a time, which was quite exciting at the time as well, with the polyphonic, with the monophonic sounds. So yeah, I mean that was it. It was I really bought it on on the strength of of having liked that. In the main, I tended to go that direction. The only that was the only Moog I ever used was the Polymoog, Polymoog, Polymoog. I don't know what you say, really. Moog. Um, yeah, Moog. Polymoog, I suppose. Um, that was the only one I ever used, and I did I did like it a lot. But I was never I never used the mini Moog, for example, at all. I never touched it. I went the pro soloist route, you know, and I think you we used the Taurus bass pedals, of course, that was a big factor, big thing with Genesis, which oh, is yeah. no, but because um, it was really good for those big fat sounds. I don't think I don't think um, ARP's ever got that quite big fat sound that you could get out of a moat, sort of all the uh, big sawtooth sort of um, thing. I don't know why, but it just that seemed the way, but it was better for subtler stuff and it, it, so it worked well for me. Well, that's what I think that, you know, there's a, when you mentioned about saying Moog before, um, I'm actually good friends with Michelle Moog and we've, 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 we've joined together in some projects and supported each other um, a lot in, in, in this journey of honoring our father's work. And, um, you know, we both have a stance of, it's, it's like uh, guitar players having a Gibson or a Fender, you know, just for example, why not have, they, they have different sounds they have different feels. They are the same uh, type of instrument, but they do different things. So um, there, there's definitely a, a room in the world for um, you know tape, multiple tastes in, in, in synthesizers, and mm -hmm. and I heartily believe in that. I definitely think that that's true. You know, like you said, the, the Moog had, has a certain propensity for certain type of sounds, and our well, I think the the profits tended to go have more that kind of Moog sound and that they could be very fat, you know, uh, which suited suited me quite well as well. So, I mean, I, in a sense, the profits sort of, you know, it's kind of took over a little bit from the from the from the, the ARPs, I think, because I used uh, the Profit 5, which was, you know, and then I had the Profit 10, so the really big sounds you could get out of that, which I used quite a lot. And, you know, obviously, because you, you could combine it with string sound. I mean, you know, it, it, it was it just 
I don't know, I mean, I used all these instruments and after that, really, a lot of the time you, um, I got into using Korg instruments and stuff just but they, you know, I found one of the first one I liked and, and then you sort of, they kept giving me them, so. <laughs> so that kind of helps a bit really because, you know, you never quite know, I always think every instrument's good for one song. And it's a matter of, uh, you know, finding what that song is. And sometimes they're good for more than one song, but the first time you hit it and you think that's fantastic and you write a whole song based on the first sound you come across. And then, you know, that's almost it sometimes. And, uh, you know, because you get very wasteful because most of these modern, even at that stage, once you got into these sort of hybrid um, synth, uh, you know, uh, sampling instruments, like the, you know, uh, the, uh, O1W, things like the, the wave station, things like that. They kind of, they just sounded so good. You got lazy about programming and doing too much, you know, in the way you do a bit and stuff. And then if you didn't like, you couldn't want another sound, you got another instrument. I mean, um, DX7, as I said, you know, and, and I suppose now, because we're sort of, we have the luxury of the computers and you can, you can get any sound you want really. Uh, so that sort of, kind of where I'm at the moment really and also with the sampling that these modern computers have um, you can sample a sound and use that as your as this as the basis just what I've done with you know some of the early instruments I use like the like the ARP sounds and also um, Synclavier sounds and things like that where I've mm. just sampled uh, them on the computer so I, I you know because often when on a song you may only be using a few notes anyhow so it's quite easy to do the sampling you just you know you use that and, works pretty well. So jumping ahead, I think that reminds me of what I wanted to ask you. You're going on tour soon. Well, we we're supposed to be on tour last year and then, then then now and then yeah, September we're supposed to be starting. But I mean God knows with the, the way things are going. Um in England it could well be delayed again. We're supposed to be in a, in, in the States in um December, I think. Uh I don't know whether that'll happen either. We'll see, you know, I hope it does happen because we put quite a lot into this, this tour. We've done all the rehearsals and got all the, all the gear. We bought all the stuff as it were. <laughs> we desperately need someone to, to come and listen to it. So, um, but uh, you know, yes. So touring is, is a possibility coming up. What, what will you bring? What, what instruments will you bring? What... I'm afraid I'll just be bringing a couple of dummy keyboards and a computer really. Um, I've actually got, I still using the Korg um, Oasis because uh, so, that's sort of like a big computer in itself, really. And I, I'm probably I, I, I've thought of trying to transfer any sounds I'm using off that onto the computer. But everything else, I used to have all these little. I used to have specialist kind of um, uh, emulator things, you know, to, to, which were set up to uh, uh, with some of the old sounds on it. But I've been able to transfer all of that onto the computer. And I uh, use main main stage, whatever, and the sampling unit within that is fantastic. Um, so I, I mean, I kind of leave, I mean, I know some people going back, I mean, I'm just perhaps too old to go back and start fiddling with knobs again. <laughs> so I kind of use, use these things because I'm really just playing the old songs. And if I'm doing anything new, which I've obviously I've done three orchestral albums recently, I'm going for orchestral sounds and computers are, are brilliant at that. You get lots of things you can pick up. Sometimes you can make a sound that's almost as good as the final thing anyhow. Um, because all the instruments are on are so good. And uh, I kind of, so I can build up an orchestral uh, thing, you know, without having to build and play the things. But um, yeah, it's, it, it's, you know, the things have changed. I mean, in the early days I used to play a guitar and as the synthesizer got better and better, I stopped playing guitar because I could play guitar on a keyboard better than I could play it with the guitar, you know? So it became a bit, un a bit unnecessary, but I do miss that a bit, really, you know, things so, um, I, I still play piano a lot. And piano, piano is still my favorite instrument. What kind of piano do you have? Well, I've got, um, at the moment I've got, well, I do have my old, the old uh, Steinway I used, um, which I took to, we, we, I used on the Lamas on a Broadway. We bought it specially for that album and I used it on that and on Trick of the Tail, the next album. And that's uh, there. Um, I've got a Yamaha upright. And I basically, <clears throat> most of the time, though, when I'm playing piano, even I'm using synthetic sounds, I'm afraid. Um, there's lots of great piano samples out there now. Philharmonic sounds are really good, you know, and, and some of the ones built into the um, into the uh, main stage. I mean, there are lots of good sounds there. I never lack for a piano. And the advantage of all that is I can do it all with headphones. It means no one has to hear my mistakes, which is quite nice. 
So um, are you using these also for um, your classical compositions? Um, do you use um, acoustic piano or do you are you using electronic? I use a bit of, bit of each. I sometimes use acoustic piano. Um, I tend to, because of the way I did the last record, um, I did the whole thing using um, on in this room actually with, with my piano as it sampled and said, so I, I did the whole thing with that and then did all the instrumentation to that. And I wanted to try and get on this particular record, I wanted to try and get as close as possible to my demos because I, I was really happy with the way the demo sounded. So I ended up using most of my piano part I'd done uh, because obviously to some extent the piano modifies all the time because you know you can fiddle around with the timing and stuff and correct any errors obviously. And, and so it became a sort of template in a way. Oh. Uh, and I could have replayed the whole thing with using a real piano and maybe if I, I might have could have done that. Some of it was unplayable probably <laughs> because of the way you fiddle around with it, you know. Um, and so, com you know, I, I so I tended that tended to make it right through to the record. So there's a lot of piano on the record, but it is probably all done from the sample sounds. Um, it's never a lead instrument, so it doesn't matter as much as all that. Uh, the, I used a real orchestra for everything. Did embellish it a bit with a few a few of these few of the computer sounds, but in the main, um, and that was. And so by using it as a template, it meant all, this, all the tempos and everything were totally defined, which was crucial for me because on the previous one, as I'd done, tempos are somebody got, sometimes got totally out of control. So that's, that's kind of how I do it these days, but, you know. Does it surprise you to know that ARPs were um, invented by a, a classical pianist? Not, not necessarily, no. I mean, because I, I could see how it might originally, you know, I think the thing about a lot of keyboard players are quite, mathematical as well. And I think you need that combination of sort of maths and music to mm -hmm. produce an instrument like that. And, um, you know, and obviously the early uses of the of the ARP, it seemed to be very much in the sort of, you know, the classical world, you know, the way it was used with the switched on bark and everything. Um, so I, I, I'm not, I'm not really too surprised with that really, no. Yeah. Actually, also keyboard instruments, isn't it? I mean, you're working from a keyboard and it's a natural thing. Obviously we, it, it, it seems silly almost to say it, but, because a key keyboard can play all the all the play, you've got five fingers, ten fingers even, uh, so you can do all this stuff with it and things, and that's why it's it's the the go to instrument if you're using a computer, you know, because unless you can't play, in which case you might do it all with with sort of dots and stuff, but you know most computers are programmed using a keyboard because it's the easiest thing to do, so I think it's a natural start and to be a pianist to be a start start all this stuff. Switch on Bach um, was on um, my father. That was that was my father's tipping point when he heard Switch on Bach mm. uh, uh, w when he was using Moogs, I believe, and um, it it changed his life. This was his tipping point. You know, he was an electronic engineer mm. who studied piano as as um, as a child and continued playing classical all his life. As a matter of fact, the last day of his life, he played the he got up in the morning and played piano, which is. Mm. I think is 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 just amazing that that uh, he he was able to do that and and um, and have that be there for him. Um, I'm sorry. Anyway, it's still it's it's not. It's only been a few years. So it's, it, it gets me sometimes. Um, but yeah, that was his tipping point to hear an electronic instruments such as Moog be able to be emulated in such a way and Bach is, is one of his his all-time favorites you know um, that 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 was the tipping point I think we all have this tipping point of when we you know we must do this we have to do this you know yeah. um, so going back full circle of when uh, you started playing um, music you said uh, as as you started to uh, uh, get a little bit older in your teen years you, you you didn't like as much as you used to and and I would imagine that's what drove you to make music it's like okay I I, I need to make music that I like well that, that's part of partly and I also think you you know you, you sort of I mean there's no doubt that the first time you ever hear a person play sort of EAB on on a guitar is exciting it just is you know so by the time you've heard it sort of 10,000 times it's beginning to pull a bit and um I think that's the thing really so you know, I, I don't listen much to to modern. I mean, I hear songs I quite like, but it, nothing excites me in the way that those things in the 60s did. You know, that's why I mentioned before things like the Beatles and obviously the Thunder Garfunkel and all that Tamla Motown stuff. It's the first time I've ever heard those kind of things. 
And they're uh, very imaginative too, those songs. A lot of those songs, I think the problem I have with modern, so many modern classical, uh, not modern, modern pop music, is that it tends to stick very much in one thing. You know, you have a verse and a chorus often in the same chord sequence. Um, the guy does the sort of what, almost a natural thing on top of it, normally very simple chord sequences. And they sell millions of records, so <laughs> they, can't, they can't be faulted. But um, the great thing about the Beatles is always the middle eights were always great, you know. Um, and they did things that you'd never heard before. When I heard, I want to hold your hand, for example, and suddenly the change the key to the middle, just a slight change of key, brilliant. Um, and obviously Holland, Dozier Holland did that all the time. And it was fantastic with Free Child, I'll Be There. Yeah. Even something like Baby, I Need Your Loving, which changes the key into the chorus, you know. It's, it's such a lift. I love mm -hmm. that effect. I, that's, that's what Genesis is all about for me, is that change. The, the moment you change and suddenly, even if you play something quite straightforward afterwards, you put it on another level and it, it just you know i think the chorus of baby i need your loving is a prime example of that you know you've got a simple two very simple pieces but because of the way it changes into the chorus you suddenly it becomes something else and um you know and i've always been an admirer of that and you know great writers like uh, paul simon and people do that a lot and uh, that's that's the thing obviously i have mentioned the beach boys obviously who are a massive influence on me oh particularly the uh well, Pet Sounds is an extraordinary album, came out of nowhere, I think, absolutely nowhere. Suddenly an album that was so imaginative in musical sense and chords and everything. You know, a song like Don't Talk, put you out of my shoulder. I mean, because the, 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 the harmonising in that is just brilliant. And um, and the theremin. Well, yeah, all the sounds on it are great, but it's, I'm just talking also about just the, uh, it's just the, the way that the music is written. And yet it's still kind of like God only knows is, it's not a simple piece of music, but it sounds simple, and that's what's so great about it. And that's that's the real art, I think, to to use subtle, you know, complexity, but make it sound simple is is one of the arts, I think. What um, I'm finding it um, interesting, and I was wondering what you think of the resurgence of interest in analog synthesizers, where uh, after having the world at your fingertips, as you mentioned, you know, just having uh, you know the sky's the limit with digital with vsts and 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 uh digital environments um that that people want to have these you know large uh unpredictable synthesizers again um what do you think about that what do you make of that well i think it's up to them if they want to do that i mean there's a lot of people who say that kind of um you know they when cd came in they all said oh the vinyl sounds much better I don't think it ever sounded better. And CDs, and I think if you did a blind test on these things, apart from the fact that vinyl always had scratches and things on it, and all the compromises you had to make to fit the bloody thing on the record in the first place. <laughs> uh, we used to, because we used to do over length albums and you'd have to sort of, the, the final track had to sort of come down in level and be, you know, they often were a big climax, you know, we'd have this big climax and we'd get quieter and quieter and you'd have to fit it on there. No, we, I love CDs. And I think digital stuff, I mean, well, the only thing I would say is that, that you have with the um, analogs, which obviously is much more difficult to do with the digital, is the ability to sort of, to, to kind of change it in, in real time, you know. Um, so if you want to sort of, you know, open a filter or fatten it up or do something, you can do that. I can understand how it would appeal to a lot of people, but the pure sounds, you know, you, you, could, you could play them, if you did a blind test, I don't think they would know the difference. I don't, I honestly don't. Um, I'm, I'm no purist actually, and my hearing's not what it was. So, uh, you know, I, I struggle to hear the very high frequency, well, even the very, even the medium high frequencies. I had a period, I had a piece on the last record I did where I've always loved triangle. And I said, we need more triangle, it should be louder. And I said, no, no, more, more, more. And the guy said, the producer guy who worked with Nick Davis said, no, if we put more triangle on, it's gonna be a triangle solo. <laughs> So um, anyhow, that's it. So my ears are not as good as they were. So I don't know, I'm not the best person to judge really. I kind of, I've always been more into the composition and the, and the, and the musical, you know, the, 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 and the thing than I've ever been into the final. So I can listen to a badly, a bad version of a thing. I've never really been a great one for listening to particular conductors or something. Um, you know, if I like a piece of music, I probably like it, but whoever does it, as long as the tempos are, roughly what I want and there's nothing too strange you know um so I kind of I'm I think that's I'm a little bit 
a little bit like that. I sort of hear the thing, and I couldn't necessarily tell you tell you too much about it beyond that. All right. Um, I think a lot of uh, music fans will be interested to hear about how you felt about ARPS, and you know, yeah. this has been a big help for us. So I really appreciate. Oh, oh that's an important part of my life, you know. So, you, know. And you said you still have some. I still, yes, I still, I've kept one or two for um, posterity. I can't say I use them anymore. I think I've got, uh, I've kept a quadra. Um, I sold a quadra the other day, actually. And, um, and I think I've still got a pro side of it. So I still, I'm keeping a 2600 just because it looks great, but nothing else. You know? <laughs> uh, fortunately, I never owned a 2500, which, uh, I remember our producer Dave Henschel, he uh, of a certain era, he had one, I think. Uh, that looked completely beyond me, you know. But um, the, so yes, no, the Quadra, I, I think the Quadra was a special instrument. So I had two of them. So um, I think I had number one and number 10, actually, or something. I think there were very few sold, I think. I think it was one of those because of, the, because of um, MIDI. It didn't really, it was, I think the profits really was what really changed, um, you know, that, that whole feel about because uh, the ability to you know the, the fact they had the midi built in was just was fantastic i think um but it was a it was a great instrument and and, uh, and i think you know i think i sold one or two of them for basically because uh, people you know heard me play the thing and they thought well i've got to have one of them um uh but uh you know i don't think they sold all that many shame but didn't yeah, we uh, we were very lucky to have someone that was going to be selling it to us, and uh, we're uh, we're very excited to have one. I play, it was so much fun. I played one for the first time. Um, there's a wonderful place in Philadelphia or uh, outside of Philadelphia called MAF, which is the Electronic Music and Education Preservation project. Um, I think I got that acronym right. Okay. And um, they have um, vast, vast collection, probably the largest synthesizer collection, I think, anywhere on the planet, mm. um, which is where I got to see the Mellotron, the insides of the Mellotron with all the, and they mm. were changing out the uh, the tapes and um, yeah. everything. And there was the um, the Polymog with the pedals, and I got to play on that. And the uh, and then the Quadra, which I had never played as a, as, um, as a youth. I think at that time, I was rebelling against synthesizers, right, <laughs> and, and playing like Gibson hollow body basses and in, in, in punk rock bands and things like that. So, right. 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 <laughs> it's like, how do you rebel against the synthesizer? I guess you go back in the other direction, right? So, yeah. um, so I never got to play one, and I always loved the sound and such a lush. L lush is the only word I can say. It's just, there's so many opportunities and so very rich and so I got to play one the other day and it was really really fun and uh and I was really excited in the context of being able to speak to you about that because uh, oh, wow. I know that's an instrument that you you love and have used um I think this is wrapping it up pretty much um I uh I think I covered most of the questions I don't think we have to get into every detail of that um is there anything else that you want to add about, uh, you know, your use of ARPs and uh, anything you want to say to people who are using them for the first time, maybe? Well, not really, no. I mean, there's only one sound I didn't didn't mention, which I used to use it for, which was quite good, is on the, the song Abacab, which I think a lot of people always search for the, the first sound on that, which was basically the, the ARP quadra, the polyphonic part of it, put through a fuzz box and combined with a couple of, with the two um, monophonics synthesizers playing at the same time oh wow and so it gives it a little bit of sort of you get a good raw sound but you can really hear the notes very clearly and uh, it was a good sound actually um it's a great I, sound. I, it's a wonderful sound. Days, I could try and fake it but it's not quite the same but it's all right <laughs> but it was a you know as i said that's the sort of thing you could do with that because it was all sort of in one instrument that's so, all i've got to say nothing else i have nothing else for it that I think you have a lot to say. But <laughs> well, this has been fantastic. I um I uh, I'm gonna stop recording.
Mm-hmm.